We are thinking about redemptive history in terms of the life of Abraham. And uh, we've been focusing a lot on Abram, uh, but today we sort of shift that focus. Uh, Sarai, his wife. As we get into it, we want to do a little bit of review of where we have been. We've come a long way to get to this point, right? We've talked about some very important themes of Scripture, and it would be those themes that I would really want you to sort of latch on to because you see that once you get it, then you see it throughout all of Scripture. Beginning with the living God as our creator and sustainer of all things seen and unseen. And it is important that we understand our God's involvement in creation. He isn't the deist God who is just sort of wound it up and is out there beyond us, uh, uh, someone that we cannot know. Rather, he is also not only transcendent but imminent. And he is involved in our lives. He is involved in the goings-on in the world. We've learned also that the Lord is also the just judge of all the earth. We learned that with his encounter with Adam and Eve in the garden after they fell, after they uh, partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But in the same scene or sequence of events, we learned that our God is redeemer as well. That is, we fell, we rebelled, but God provided a way back to himself. So when you hear of anyone asking, well, what is the way or who knows the way, you have an opportunity to say the Lord knows the way and he shows us the way in his word uh, now through Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman promised in Genesis 3.15. He will bring all things to their rightful end and he will accomplish all his purposes. Uh, humanity thinks they know a lot. Humanity thinks they can accomplish a lot and they can and they do know things, but they don't know all things and they can't do all things. They cannot accomplish all their will, uh, that is, those things that are set up against the living and true God. He will bring those things, the machinations of men, to nothing. And we have seen then that God acts according to his name, his character. The God who is compassionate and merciful, gracious, patient abounding in loving kindness and truth and forgiving sin, iniquity, and transgressions, but will by no means clear the guilty. If these things come through on the pages of the Scripture, in every event we see one or more of these things at play and the themes that we see, whether of, of just judgment or God's grace or whatever it is, these things come through and we need to look for them and search them out. Then we turn to understanding history as something other than just the facts of events that speak for themselves. You hear that a lot, you hear it today. Uh, science, let the science speak for itself. Let the facts of history speak for itself. Well, without human interpretation, those facts really don't say anything. And that's the point. There's always interpretation. No fact speaks in and of itself. And what we have learned and what we need to establish in this life is that God is the one who interprets the goings-on in life. And it is up to us to sort of get in line with what he says about it. Not with what we think we should say about it, but what he does indeed say about it. So it is interpreted. It is interpreted history by the Lord God, the living and true God. So that question needs to be answered. Who does the interpreting? We have understood history as redemptive history. 
redemptive history. So we examine the scriptures, our Bibles that we carry with us or our Bible apps that we turn to on our phone, and we examine them within their proper context as actual events. Actual events. And these actual events are events recorded for us that communicate a redemptive message. A redemptive message. Remember, we said God is our Redeemer. So in terms of humanity, we are looking at how does God then reclaim a people for himself? How does God establish a people for himself? Now Jesus speaks of Moses writing about him. And I would suggest that he didn't mean just a verse or two or a single few verses or whatever. I would suggest that he meant that the whole of Moses' writing points to him in some way, fashion, shape, or form. The whole of the focus was concerning some aspect of Jesus' life and mission. Both in his humiliation and exaltation as prophet, priest, and king. Remember Moses said, that there will be another prophet like me, listen to him, listen to him. So it is not just limited to Moses. Jesus, in his ministry with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, said that the whole of Scripture testify of him. How? It does so in his suffering and exaltation, not only in Moses, but also in the writings and the prophets. That is, the whole of the scripture in some way, shape, or form point to the Messiah, point to our hope in him. It is this redemptive historical truth of God that we keep in mind as we exegete our way throughout the scriptures. So we have covered creation, the fall and the flood, and the city and the tower that was built called Babel. This has brought us to follow Shem's genealogy through Terah, then to Abram. Now we also speak of the seed of God's promise. And we have this promise given to us in Genesis 3.15 concerning the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman. Surely the serpent who has his seed in the world would wound the seed of the woman, by bruising his heel, but he would be bruised on his head. He would be crushed. The seed of the woman would bring to an end the effects of the fall. And remember those effects. Any, any number of diseases that we see today. It isn't just about personal sin. It is, but it isn't just that. The whole of creation is subjected to corruption and futility because of man's rebellion in the beginning. So this seed of the woman would undo the corruption and futility imposed upon creation. He would undo the sin and rebellion in which humanity has been entwined. He would, in essence, take it upon himself. He took up our sins in his body on the cross. He would set us free. He would set us free. He would define for us what liberty, what freedom truly is. The linchpin of fulfillment is the seed of the woman. If the serpent could prevent the seed of the woman from coming to fruition, that would be the end of humanity. There would be no hope. We came upon the doorstep of Abram with the shocking statement of Genesis 11, verse 30. Sarai was barren. She had no child. At that point, the promise seemed to be once again prevented from coming to fruition. If your promise rests on the seed of the woman and the woman start, uh, stops bearing children, we are in trouble. We are in trouble. You see. And yet, in just the next section of Scripture, in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, 
we find the living and true God calling Abram. In that call, there is the promise of seed by whom all the families of the earth will be blessed. And we mention those families, the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They each had sons who became heads of families and tribes and nations and received the various lands. It is those families, you see, that will be blessed, that descended from them. Then in chapter 15, we find the Lord binding himself to that promise by passing through the pieces of sacrifice alone, a goat and an ox and a couple of birds and so on, and they were laid on either side. And Abram didn't pass through the midst of them as he normally would have in a human covenant, but God alone walked in the midst of them, passing through them, stating in no uncertain terms that he would fulfill his word of promise given to Abram. And if he should fail to do so, then it would mean the self-destruction of the living and true God. That's how sure his promise is. For the living and true God cannot be destroyed. So he will fulfill his word of promise given to Abram. Well, that brings us up to the point where Sarai then hatches her plan. We are ten years into the sojourn of Abram and Sarai and all that belonged to them. It had been ten years. Abram was 75. I should have quizzed you. He was 75. Oh, but here's the question. How old was Sarai? If he's 75, she's 65. Ten years later, she is 75. How many of you are 75 or maybe older? 75. See, so now imagine your wife having a child, you see, at that age. Still not having a child and yet promise. So now Sarai has a plan. As we look at the text for today, we find that it is easily broken into two main parts. Genesis 16. The first part of the text in verses 1 through 6 has to do with Sarai's plan and the implementation of it. The second part of the text, verses 7 through 16, focus upon the intervention of the angel of the Lord and his conversation with Hagar. So let's look first at the occasion of Sarai's plan in verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. I'm sure you have seen the problem here. Sarai was still barren after 10 years in the land that is promised to them. The promise of the seed of the woman appears to have been stymied, prevented from taking place. It brings our attention back to 11 verse 30 that stated Sarai was barren, she had no child. It had been 10 years and still nothing of the promise had come to fruition. Certainly Abram had established places of worship and building altars and calling on the name of the Lord. And it is very probable that several of his associates had been converted to the living and true God, the God whom Abram worshipped. Ten years in the land, though, it also means time feels like it's bearing down on you and that it's running short. Have you ever felt that way? Where you think, ooh, there's not a whole lot of time for God to work? But he does, but he does. He's not under those constraints. There were pressures here brought to bear on the situation. And lest you think too lightly of Sarai's situation, put yourself in her place. No child. No child. You're 75. You're promised a child. You've waited 10 years. Not only that, you'd have the cultural pressure of the day with being married and having children. That is, all kinds of children. I mean, that's the way of the time, you'd have plenty of children, and there was nothing. You find yourself in the mid-70s. You still don't have a child. 
something is off kilter. But you have an Egyptian maid named Hagar. She was probably acquired when your husband led everyone into Egypt, and then the Pharaoh uh, was upset and mad, and the seed of the serpent tried to steal the woman from Abram. He was unsuccessful, and he gave him gifts, right? And part of those gifts were servants. Hagar was probably among them. What comes to mind in those kinds of situations? Has God forgotten me? How long must I wait? I've heard that question many times over and over again. How long? How long must this test go on? How long must I endure? For the specific thing, I have no idea because it's not revealed in the Scripture. For the larger question, it is till your last breath on earth, you must wait. Unless God sends Christ back. So remember, aside from the story you have heard regarding Enoch, God has not intervened in this way before. You certainly understand that he did so in terms of judgment, the great flood, the tower at Babel, but not in terms of the promise like this. What do you do? What do you do when you find yourself in her situation? Well, Sarai thought of the same thing you would have thought of had you lived during that time. So she implements her plan. What was her plan? Well, first, her evaluation. Everybody enters into an evaluation of some sort or another in life. We evaluate our means of earning a living. We evaluate uh, our friendships. We evaluate where we're going to worship together with God's people. All those things, we enter into evaluation, and so does she. She says, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Is this true? Would you agree with that? The Lord is prevent. I mean, today, what do we do? We go down to the clinic, right? Either get some shots or get some pills, and perhaps we get pregnant or in vitro fertilization, any number of things. They didn't have that. Well, to the Jewish mind, it is in terms of the scripture and how they thought of those days. And I think we would do well to pay attention to that. Remember how we noted that God is involved in the affairs of this life. He's not just outside looking in or occasionally checking in. No, he's involved in life. Listen to the interaction. I've jumped ahead a little bit, but this gives you a good idea of the mindset, which takes place later on between Jacob and Rachel. In Genesis 30, verses 1 and 2, we read, Now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she became jealous of her sister, Leah. She said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. Then Jacob's anger burned against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God, who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Am I in his place where I can just order it to be done? You see? That's the mindset. It, it all hinged on what God wanted. And they trusted in him uh, along the way and during the process. Well, second, her specific plan involved Hagar. Sarai gave Hagar to Abram as his wife, the text says. Why? Well, it goes on to say, so that perhaps I will obtain children through her. This is typical Near Eastern cultural practice whereby a barren woman may obtain children through a maid or some other person given as a wife whereby the couple may have an heir. Right? No child, no heir. 
So I ask you, would you have a child for me? Then you give birth, it's literally at her knees. So Sarai is right there in the birthing process. And the child would become hers. So it appears that the woman is now fulfilling what the Lord told Eve, that she will desire or master her husband, right? Remember that interaction and what God said to the woman, your desire will be for him. That same word there was the same thing that God used to, in his conversation with Cain about sin. Sin's desire is to master you. But you must overcome it, you see. Abram, in response, acquiesced to his wife. And Hagar conceived. But instead of the acknowledgement of Sarai, as should have transpired, the Bible says that she was despised in her sight. Hagar became pregnant. Sarai hadn't after ten years. Hagar despised Sarai. At this point, the idea of having children through Hagar was not going to happen. Immediately, she recognized the wrong done, but instead of owning up to it, she blamed Abram. But certainly, he is culpable for his own failure in this situation. He should have never have pursued that. You don't pursue... By the flesh, what God promises, what God promises. So he should have overruled his wife in the beginning. He shouldn't have been so willing to go along. He failed to do so. And so this raises a significant redemptive historical question. Would the son of Abram and Hagar be the seed through whom the blessing of God would come to the families of the earth instead of Sarai? Because we're never told up until this point specifically that it would be Abram and Sarai. We might have been assuming it, but now all of a sudden it's Abram and Hagar. To state it another way is to ask, is the seed of the woman shifting from Shem to Ham? We're given some clues, but not a definitive answer at this point. As Sarai blamed Abram, she said, May the wrong done me be upon you, and may the Lord judge between you and me. We often like to do that, don't we? Throwing in the Lord in our conversations that make us feel superior or something, I guess. Yes, may the Lord judge between you and me, dear. Instead of falling on our knees in worship and seeking him. It is typical of us human beings, isn't it, to blame others for our own sins. If, if you just hadn't done that, I would have never have gotten angry. <clears throat> you see, shifting a little bit there. Just as both Adam and Eve shifted the blame in the garden, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit. Yeah, well, then I ate. So Sarai takes the focus off herself and places it upon Abram. Abram, for his part, gave Sarai her maid back when he said to her, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. This seems to have effectively eliminated the forthcoming child from Hagar as the son of promise. In essence, in essence he divorces her and gives her back to Sarai, no longer to be a wife or a concubine. Sarai, for her part, decided that it was in her best interest to treat Hagar harshly for being despised in her sight. Waiting on God is a tough thing to do. Having the whole of Scripture before us and the benefit of hindsight, we say, Abram and Sarai should have trusted the Lord in their situation, and yes, they should have. But how often can that be said of you and I? How long are you willing to wait, you see? How long are you willing to wait? Like every other human being, we tend to want what we want when we want it. I want what I want when I want it. 
It's about me. What about my needs? What about, right? You've probably heard that or something similar. <laughs> Dare I say, you may have said that. But the Lord is about training us in righteousness, you see. And in order to be trained in righteousness, there are several things that need to happen. The Lord needs to teach us patience. The Lord is teaching us how he works in the world and contrary to the world. You see, there are things going on that are beyond us that we need to focus on. For the promise of the word is that he works to our good. That is, to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But now the Lord intervenes. So this is not the end of the story. Very often this would be the end of the story, but it still needs to resolve. What's going to happen to Hagar and her son? More importantly, how will God's word of promise given to Abram in Genesis 12 come to bear on this situation? The last phrase of verse 6 says, And she fled from her presence. And normally that would be the end of the story. But God is at work in this child as a son of Abram. Now the Lord knew everything about that situation. And of course the angel of the Lord would as well who meets Hagar and speaks to her. And the angel of the Lord is very probably the second person of the Trinity in physical form. Taking on physical form appearing to others in the Old Testament time. That is, who the person that we know of is Jesus. Nevertheless, very reminiscent of the garden, he asks, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? Again, the question is asked in such a way as to help Hagar gain understanding. The angel of the Lord knew exactly. It's not for his benefit. It's for her benefit. So she responds, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. When you look at the geography of where Hagar is fleeing to, you understand that she is going back to the only land she knew, Egypt. But the angel of the Lord finds her and gives her instruction and not of the kind we would anticipate. Think about, not, oh, I've already read that, I already know about it. Think about it in terms of just seeing it for the first time. Think about it as it is unfolding in history. And he says something that we wouldn't anticipate by saying, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Now lest we forget, Hagar had rebelled against Sarai's authority when she despised her after conceiving. This does not justify Sarai's treatment of Hagar, treating her harshly, but neither does it justify Hagar's actions. This child that Hagar has in her womb is a son of Abram. And the Lord, in just the previous chapter, promised what? To multiply the seed of Abram as the stars of the heavens. Now the angel of the Lord was not done speaking to Hagar. He said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. And still further he said, Behold, you are with child and you will bear a son. And you will call his name Ishmael because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. The Lord has given heed to your affliction. At this point, we begin to understand there is something else going on here. As Moses' intended readers, that is, Moses is penning these words after the exodus out of Egypt, and they're in the wilderness, and he's writing these things down, and the sons of Israel are reading these words. They would see in Hagar something of themselves. The Lord had given heed to the afflictions of Hagar. He had done so just as in Israel's recent past. 
He had given heed to their afflictions, the sufferings that were going on as they were under bondage in the land of Egypt. They had endured unjust afflictions just as she had, and the Lord intervened according to promise. Another important thing to note here is that Hagar was not in opposition to the Lord's promise, but opposed Sarai's plan. She refused to have this child on behalf of Sarai. But that raises another question, right? What would become of the boy? What would become of him? The answer to this question constitutes the rest of the angel of the Lord's discourse. He tells her, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone. Right? The old saying, you're as stubborn as a mule. He will be a donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone. And everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live to the east of all his brothers. To answer the question, the boy will become a man who lives in conflict. This, in part, is the story of humanity, right? Living in conflict. You see, there's only one answer for peace, and that isn't through your ideas or my ideas. It's through whom the Lord provided in Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. It calls to mind the enmity that the Lord God placed between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And he will live at cross purposes with those around him. God had seen the affliction of Hagar and he gave, her, gave heed to her condition. And he assured her of his blessing. And this really is an amazing thing. You know... Those on the outside looking in often say, ah, oh, women are just so poorly treated in the Bible. We got to get rid of the patriarchy, right? Here is God the Father in his treatment of Hagar and treating her very gently and blessing her abundantly, right? Abram hadn't asked for the Lord's blessing on this child, but the Lord called Abram and extended his blessing graciously. We got to remember we are undeserving of the good things of life. We, we so often in commercials just reinforce it. You deserve this. You deserve so much. Biblically speaking, we deserve nothing. And everything good that we have and good that we enjoy in life is because of our Father in heaven, extending his blessing. Hagar hadn't asked for the Lord's blessing, right? We don't read in there that she begged the angel of the Lord to bless her and her son. But the Lord called out to Hagar and extended his blessing, for he is a God who sees. He is a God who sees. Now apparently the angel of the Lord had departed and the realization of what had just transpired began to hit Hagar. That's, you know, we're a day late and a dollar short. Imagine the questions you could ask if you know who you're talking to. And then they leave and you realize, I should have, right? The realization of what had just transpired begins to hit Hagar. She responds to the situation by saying, You are a God who sees. Have I even remained alive here after seeing him? She knew she had an encounter with the living and true God, you see, the angel of the Lord. The name of the well, therefore, where she was at, was called Beer Lahiroi. The meaning of this name, it seems to be the well of the living one who sees. The well of the living one who sees. Get it? The well of the living one who sees. The idols that we create from our own hearts and imaginations, what, what aren't they? They aren't living and they can't see. 
And if they can't see and if they're not living, then they cannot give heed to our situations in life. Let that sink in. Hagar carries with her the blessing of God, and thus she obeys the voice of the angel of the Lord in return to Abram and Sarai. She gives birth to a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Now the Lord turned this series of events into a blessing for them all. <laughs> Abram and Sarai would have a living testimony of the God who sees not just sees, but when he sees, he takes heed to one's difficulties and afflictions. <clears throat> now, a word of caution here. It may not be in the way that you think he ought to act or take heed to. It may not be how you think it ought to be played out in life. But that does not negate that God sees and heeds your life and what's going on in your life, and the weights that you carry from time to time, the burdens that you carry. As we wrap up our thoughts today, living by the promise of God, beloved, can be very difficult, right? It can be hard. I'm not going to deny that. We're not going to sugarcoat it. It can be hard. Uh, to do so means that you must be trusting and patient. He's teaching you this in the midst of it all. You must do so while those who belong to the world seem to be blessed, all the while living contrary to whom our God is. Isn't that the way it seems? Why does that person seem to be so blasphemous and yet seem so blessed? And in those moments of despair or difficulty or trial or testing which we each endure, it is important that we understand we serve a God who sees. We serve a God who sees. Who sees our afflictions. Who sees the burdens we carry. Who sees the weight of life upon us. Because he sees, he understands the nuances of life and the currents of life. When we examine the lives of Abram and Sarai, we need to understand what is written from their perspective. They had lived in a land of promise to them as aliens and strangers for ten years. Ten years. And the rest of the scripture had not been written yet. We're only up. To chapter 16. That's it. They didn't have everything else. And given redemptive history to this point, there was not much to go on. There was the promise of God given to, the, to Eve, and there's the promise of God given to Noah. There's the promise of God that is spoken of in terms of Enoch. There's the promise of God now given to Abram. what they did have was the promise of God. That's the key. And it's key for you. Just like them, you will be tempted in this life to accomplish what you believe God needs to accomplish according to the flesh. Well, if God isn't going to do it, I'm going to take matters into my own hands and I'm going to do it. It doesn't work that way, beloved. Rather than waiting on Him in faith. Now, it doesn't mean that we just sit idly by but we continue to live faithfully before him, seeking to honor him and living out grateful lives. May you and I learn from this account of Abram and Sarai and live out our lives self-consciously in light of the God who sees. And because he sees, he takes heed to your situation. Father in heaven, thank you for your word to us. And again, thank you for who you are in your compassion and mercy and grace, your loving kindness, for forgiving us our sins, iniquities, and transgressions, for upholding all things by the word of your power, 
for being the God who sees. And so, Lord, may you continue to teach us your ways that we may walk in them for your glory, for the sake of your people. We make our appeal to you through Christ. Amen.